I'm your host Nalini Haynes and today I'm talking to Jeanette Ng. She's originally from Hong Kong but now lives in Durham, UK. She has an MA in Medieval and Renaissance Studies which fed into an interest in medieval and missionary theology which in turn spawned her love for writing gothic fantasy with a theological twist which I have to say I've never read anything like it. Um, she, she runs live role playing games and is active within the costuming community running a popular blog. She's been a finalist for the John W. Campbell Award for the Best New Writer and the Sydney J. Bounds Award Best Newcomer in the British Fantasy Awards. She's shortlisted for Starburst's 2017 Brave New Worlds Award and the 2018 Robert Holdstock Award for Best Fantasy Novel at the British Fantasy Awards. Named by Siffy as one of the best the 10 best sci-fi and fantasy books of 2017 and included in Adam Roberts list of the best science fiction and fantasy of 2017 and I have to say Adam Roberts being a professor of 19th century literature that's quite an accolade. <laughs> oh no um, uh, my partner went to hear him talk a while back uh, and he came back saying well I see how you got on that list Jeanette you just you just wrote you wrote a book pandering to literally everything he loves and I'm like yeah yeah I know uh the book was just genetically engineered for him um so well how about how about you tell us about your book Under the Pendulum Sun oh, right um it says that my MA fed into my interest in, in, in missionary theology, which is sort of accurate in the sense that it all started when I was very bored at the library one day and and I, I picked up um, a book on, on missionaries. It was a Victorian missionary manual and in it, um, it talks about how a missionary should behave when, when when trying to convert people and it talks about like it describes the Chinese um, and it was racist <laughs> um, um, it was and it, it described people who didn't sound like people um, it, it described them as um, as you know oh yes you know they have all the all the things you'd expect from a human being they have two eyes you know two ears a nose and a mouth and two two arms two legs and, and so forth and you list the things and and if you have and as you read in pendulum sun I, I literally just ripped that passage straight out and changed a couple of words because because um, that was kind of the joke of pendulum sun that I thought it'd be really funny if the missionaries actually saw met people who were other who as who were as other as they wanted to meet or were expecting to meet um rather than you know people who are people <laughs> um and and that's kind of the the clash of ideologies that comes across in in the story that um they, they meet the thing that they were expecting to meet and and it goes badly for them very very badly um and it's also a gothic novel so um it it it, it plays with all the ludicrous trappings of gothic novels um but sort of turned up to to 11. um we have we have the giant castles and and we have the haunted house and the weirdness and, and all that and, and we have the <gasps> drama um and it, and again you know we, we we're flirting with all those kind of traditional gothic novel themes of 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 sin and redemption and salvation and dark secrets and yeah like that's that's what the novel's about <laughs> I, I blame a lot of the stuff on Percy Shelley um uh and Byron because I was cribbing a lot of, of a lot of their ideas of how there's all these things work um Sh Shelley um sense um well got censored um but multiple times um but um uh, he wrote um, Loud and Cynthia, which has a central incestuous romance, which um, he had to take out. Um, they, the, his publisher burnt all the copies and it got changed from, you know, brother or slash sister to friend. So Loud and Cynthia in his version, um, which was eventually published, was 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 friends. And I thought, eh, let, let's let's go the whole hog. So um, so Loud, um, the name, I mean, it, it, if 
it, it's not it's not one of his famous poems, so I don't think anyone spotted that. Um, and obviously, Kathy is from Wuthering Heights, so that's the kind of the pairing. Um, and so it, it's kind of riddled with these little jokes and all these little references. Yes, um, early the first half of the book, I was thinking. I was probably thinking kind of Wuthering Heights kind of, well, probably more Wuthering Heights than Jane Eyre. Um, but you have to remember I've only read these books like once. And also Lark's Rise to Candleford. And I'm, and just it was just things like the intonation, <clears throat> the way you described things. It, it just, it to me, it, it exuded 19th century literature and then as it got further into it i'm thinking ballet i'm thinking you know all, all of this yeah yeah and then, i mean that has the whole ship drowning scene and the, mm. the, the she goes into the mists and the ships and that's kind of the the valette dream mm. um i marinated in the kind of brontes and, and shelley and the romantics and kind of stumbling out of that i i wrote this book so some people say I, I, I kind of I have the voice mm. of that kind of weird, posh kind of Victorian voice. But I find like I don't I don't see it. Um, I, oh, I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, like um, I always find my sentences weirdly short and um, it's all very staccato in my head. I mean, compared to Suzanne Clark, it's a it's a very bad imitation of a Victorian voice, but but I try. Well, I I think you do a very good job. Thank you. Um, but um, some of the little references, um, because that's how I well, I mean, when I describe the book, I'm kind of it, it's a sort of um, it's one of those. Uh, first year English things, a professor says something that gets stuck in your head forever. And it's the idea that literature is a tissue of quotations. Um, and I think sometimes I think I write like that. I, I, I like kind of, it's that magpie mind thing where you kind of, you, you steal things from everywhere and then it kind of just kind of combines in your head. Um, Birdforth, for example, where they come from is, is a real place. I mean, it's, it's, it just sounds so magical to me, like, you know, Birdforth, like where birds come from. Um, um, well, the science, you actually have genuine science worked into this oh. fantasy Victorian Gothic novel. So how did you manage to do that? And and what is the uh, science? Oh, so I got very um, enamoured of this idea of the pendulum sun. Um, I mean, it became eventually the title, though. Um, the title isn't my own. Um, it was originally called A Sin Like Salt, which is a reference to the whole salt thing. And I like the idea of like uh, a love like salt. I don't know. It, 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 was, it was the original title. Um, and the pendulum sun itself comes from, I think, as a role play game, which had it in mechanical dream i think it's belgian um and it, it ha they have a son called the pendulum in the setting and i kind of like i really like that um but I, I wanted it to be weirder and and obviously once your son is on a string like a, a pendulum it wouldn't do the you're, you're working a completely different model of of light and how it would relate to people and where they are and the day night cycle which is which is different from the one we have on earth because our sun doesn't do that mm. um so i i did you know a bunch of back of the envelope calculations and and then after a while i was like i'm, I'm i was struggling so i found my friend who's a physicist um um it's very useful these people um <laughs> uh, bought him several coffees um and just shouted at him um until he volunteered to um do some more back of the envelope calculations and he made eventually made for me a little graph um and i learned a lot um from him and one of the big things that he suggested was that um human eyes are very good at seeing light and because there is no horizon um for the sun to vanish behind it would be very hard for fairyland to have pure night um and we batted around a couple ideas to to solve this solve because I, I wanted it to be dark because it's gothic so it had to be dark and he's like well you know we could put a lampshade uh we just need the light to fall off a bit so if there was like mist all the time that would help and i'm like yes 
Mist, that's thematically appropriate. Let's have everything covered in mist all the time. That's great. Perfect. Um, so so in Fairyland, everything is covered in mist all the time. And and we worked through a lot of ideas like that. Um, I'm probably mangling all of the explanations. But what I liked about that process was that it brought me to think about things and build the world in a way that I feel like I wouldn't have otherwise. Mm. And I think that's what's interesting about this sort of writing, where you push yourself, you take an idea that sounds cool, um, and then you push it further, mm. um, and you make it more extreme is perhaps the wrong word, but you, you, you work it through, and at the other end of that, it becomes something more interesting, more grounded and weirder than you perhaps would have imagined otherwise. And, and that that process is, is what I find fascinating. And, and along the way, you find connections to other things that fit together. And and the world is full of these beautiful little coincidences. You don't really plan it, but it kind of works out for you and, and, and the story. Mm. Um, so what I quite liked is um, um, my physicist friend pointed out that if if you had this endless plane, which Fairyland apparently is now an endless plane, um, it's a flat surface, um, and you've got the sun in the middle kind of heating up the, the area where the fairies live, um, the, the air would be constantly expanding outwards because it, it, this bit's warm and outside is presumably not warm, question mark. Um, and he jokingly said that if so, they'll just run out of air because the air would be constantly pushed outwards when there'd be this this ice wall around. Um, well, it's not ice. It would be a wall of ice and also um, um, solid oxygen and solid nitrogen and so forth. And I'm like, that sounds really cool. What if I sent like goblins out there to mine that and drag it back into the center and it doesn't actually solve scientifically the problem because physically they wouldn't be actually able to mine enough nitrogen oxygen and so forth to keep the cycle going but the idea of it is just very pleasing um and obviously that tied into the idea that um and like Mr. Benjamin at that time was uh, missing a backstory. So it's like, oh, let's make him an X minor. That'd be great. <gasps> we could have the mines be shut down, get in that dig to Margaret Thatcher. Um, <laughs> oh. Because I could. Sorry, so, I, I remember that. I remember the minor strikes. <laughs> there you go. Um, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a glancing reference, but every now and again, someone tweets me going, oh my God, is this Margaret Thatcher? And it's like, yes, yes, yeah. it is. Um, um, I mean, I, I, mean I, I live in the Northeast of England. We, we remember that every year um, constantly. So, um, so yeah, that, that's kind of where, where all the little pieces come from and, and it kind of all fits together. And I, I like that. Um, I, I like the idea of using science in, in fantasy world building like that. Um, not partly because it, and it's not because I think science is inherently virtuous as a process. It's just that it gives you all these like weird little things that you could just push your world building a little bit further. And, and you know, I, I could have started out with a process of like, mm, it's magic. Stop looking at me. It just makes sense. Um, and, and I think, it would have been slightly less interesting. I wouldn't have arrived to the places I did. And because in the end, my answer is still, it's magic, stop asking my questions. But by asking just a few more questions, it's a little bit more interesting. Um, and that that's kind of how I, I see how that works. Oh, I agree. I had a life drawing teacher that said that um she absolutely maintained that if you drew things from real life, they're actually more interesting and more detailed than if you drew them from your imagination. And she was probably one of these people that would only draw real things. But I kind of agree that if you base something that you draw on something that's real, I mean, you get... Um, like you can always tell when something's badly photoshopped because the lighting isn't right or something like that. <laughs> and and I think if you base yeah. it more on something that's real, it, yeah, I think it looks yeah. better. Um, and, I, and I think your, your world building really benefits from this kind of partly scientific and partly twisted view. I mean, things like 
the coach and the cow. Apparently the seats felt a bit weird because they were leather seats and the leather was borrowed from cows that aren't dead. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, it was a. It was sort of a, a running joke um, early on that the fairies just didn't really understand people. So the idea that they just were working off sort of secondhand knowledge of what people are, what people, what humans do, and 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 that was that was kind of a thing for a while. Um, I thought it was and I, delightful. I find that sort of thing hilarious. <laughs> um, and the sea um, whale. And <laughs> And, and I needed to be creepy. Oh yes, the sea whale. Oh dear lord. Yeah. And that that also owes its um its origin to, uh, well, it's a combination of sort of like the Natural History Museum in London has that big kind of Jaws whales exhibit thing, um, and also a kind of com um, and there's a, there's a giant wicker whale again. It's another one of those art exhibits. Um, was touring the UK for a bit. Um, yeah, I just stole it off someone who made a wicker whale. And I was like, yeah, that's cool. I like wicker whales. Um, I, I love things that are submerged. And there are, there are a whole bunch of kind of modern art um, exhibit things which are submerged. Um, Durham has. Um, so along the river, we have a bunch of um, statues. Uh, and one of them is um, basically the, 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 the steeple of what seems like an underground church except like a completely buried church and all you see is the steeple and i always that's what i always think of when i pass it i think there's like a giant cathedral underneath like the ground and, and obviously there isn't but i like to think there is um so i i like i i like things like i, I like a lot of things like that i like a lot of modern art and i'm I, i'm very shameless in how that kind of transmutes into my writing well you know what they say if you only reference one thing it's plagiarism and if you reference hundreds it's research <laughs> um in um under the pendulum sun you explore the idea of whitewashing which i found particularly appealing can can you tell us a bit about that that specific passage is actually a reference to um, the Brontes. Um, specifically, the Brontes did that. Um, they 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 made up these fictional worlds. The fictional worlds that it lists are the names of the ones created by the Brontes, um, and it's 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 a thing which they did. Um, it's it's pretty much um, they they one of them declared one of their tin soldiers was. Um, uh, Wellington, Arthur Wellington, um, and they they created all these fantastical worlds, and they and they they themselves were like jinns who 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 kind of created these fantastical worlds and gave it to um, Wellington um, and, and and eventually his descendants, and and they each wrote like reams of stories, mm -hmm. and they made little um, and I, I ripped all that straight from their lives. I was really uncreative, um, but the thing about it is. If you read that work, and it, it it's it's not bad. Um, um, I mean, it's, it's the Brontes. I mean, they, they write pretty well. Um, um, a lot of Anne and Emily's work on that it has been lost, but um, uh, a lot of um, Charlotte still is uh, like you know still kicking around, and um, uh, Branwell also contributed because he 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 worked with Charlotte on um, on the sort of Duke of Wellington fanfic, as we call it. Um, but but the thing is. The thing is, when you start reading it, as you notice, the fantastical worlds they're describing, um, and you know, they they have allegedly deserts, um, and it's you know, it's, it's sort of a new world, and it's obviously kind of this very colonial tone, um, but it it just sounds like Yorkshire, like whenever they actually describe anything, um, and and that always struck me um, as cute, but also. Um, and yeah, like small, um, they they've not seen outside their their homes in Yorkshire, and it's and and they they're kind of they're 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 taking all these ideas from far away from from these periodicals that their dad was ordering. As I say, I stole the backstory straight from there, and 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 they they make these things, but they can only make what they know. Hmm. Um, 
and and they know ultimately what's outside their window. Mm. And, you know, I don't fault them. I mean, they're like 12 at that point. I felt that, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I felt like you were commenting not just on Victorian literature, but probably a lot more broadly on colonialism in yeah. literature. Yes, um, there's, there's, I mean, the whole thing is, I mean, it's a very colonial setup, um, and, and in some ways, it's, it's reflected in, in the weirdness of, of, um, of fairyland to an extent. I mean, they. I mean, they, they, they actually, fairyland's a very narcissistic space for them because they, they go into fairyland, but they don't, they don't arrive elsewhere. They see a, a dark mirror of their selves. They, it's a travel into themselves rather than outwards. Um, but that's kind of a lot of colonial literature is like that. I mean, Heart of Darkness isn't about Africa so much as it's about confronting the darkness inside the heart of man, by which we mean this white guy. Um, a lot of that sort of colonial literature where you go out to the frontier and find yourself isn't about the frontier, it's about you. And and Under the Pendulum Sun kind of takes that to its kind of logical extreme in the sense that they go out to the frontiers of reality um, and they see themselves. But it's very literal. I mean, they, they literally find a castle built for them, which is and and they they find people who are very very interested on the inside of their brains so it's all very convenient um um well the flip side of whitewashing is representation so can you tell me what you think of representation i think representation often gets talked about in terms of people wanting to see kind of facsimiles of themselves mm. so a sort of a one to one thing you know i'm looking for someone who is exactly like me um and and i think that's a very simple way of explaining it um and i think because you know a lot of discussion um especially kind of like if you're reading random magazine articles it, it kind of sticks to the kind of the one the kind of um the, the the introduction to representation which is there there is no one who looks remotely like me on tv and that's true like but like that that is important um but on the kind of the, the, the secondary level of representation the way i start thinking about it is diversity is good having having multiple voices lots of voices out there is good um because you start to see yourself not as a as a one-to-one -one thing as in ah yes here is another woman who is from hong kong who has exactly the same life experience to me but she went to a slightly different boarding school um and she's written another book and and you know isn't she exactly like me and and i can so relate to her it it's more that you see your rep your experience is kind of fragmented like you, you see certain that that like so i was at the british museum british museum no the british library it's next to king's cross um and they had a exhibition on kind of the windrush generation and writings from the about from about slash from the windrush generation because britain is going through all sorts of things at the moment and that's relevant and not in a good way there was a, a, a little snippet of of text where um a, the black writer was talking about leaving uh, leaving their home and coming to england and how they expected england to be this magical place and it was this rite of passage for them and it was this expectation of the magic of england that really got in my head and it got right under the my skin and i was reading it and i was like tearing up and, and you know, in all honesty, there there was very little in common in a very literal sense between um, this writer and myself. Um, like we we we're writing, we are from completely different decades. We mm. were different racially and so forth. I mean, we're both touched by Britain, the British colony as a, as an enterprise. But you know, Hong Kong is a completely different colony. Hong Kong is a really weird colony um, from many other places. Um, and yet, that, that there is that kind of that 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 sense of commonality and i feel um in my mind um representation isn't about this one-to-one -one. it's about everyone getting a say and you start seeing yourself more in other people because everyone gets a, gets like gets to gets to have their voice heard 
Um, so in a multiplicity of stories, you you like this bit of you might identify with this bit yeah. of them, but this bit of you will identify with something yeah. else. Yeah, and and that's and that that comes from this great diversity of experiences of people talking and, and seeing all these things, um, and so it's and it's not necessarily about like someone who is identical to me writing. Um, not that there isn't people who are like me writing. Um, I, I always kind of find it um, amusing on some level um, that Zen Cho, um, Sorcerer to the Crown, um, which is a brilliant book, um, also a kind of Victorian um, pastiche, and she's also, um, she's also East Asian. We're like basically the same age. Um, and I think she's also a very successful lawyer, but you know, um, and which which I am not. That that was the implicit statement. So I, I she's lawyer. I am not. Like she's she's just better at this. But uh, um, but we have a lot of commonalities between her book and mine. Um, and she has she, there's a sort of Victorian pastiche to her style and the sort of fairies. Um, I think we were both quite inspired by Suzanne Clark, and but they're very different books. Um, um, very, very different books. Um, I've, um, I grew up in Hong Kong and I, I never had that quite same, why isn't um, someone East Asian, like someone, someone Chinese on TV, that, that never really, I, I never had that experience because I also had Hong Kong media to look at and that was full of Chinese people, um, or full of specifically Hong Kong people. Um, but but I had that thing where you'd write stories about people, like I would, I would write things kind of mimicking stuff like Enid Blyton that was reading, and you know they'd be full of stories about you know children called Peter and and Jane because that that's the kind of people who go on adventures and stories, right? Um, and, and and so my relationship with kind of English literature and the canon as a whole. I always felt like an imposter, um, and I felt like doubly like an imposter when when I was writing, not when I was writing Pendulum Sun, because I always kind of felt, well, you know, well, obviously I'm allowed to write this, um, and it wasn't until it was published and I started kind of talking to people about it and going, huh, I wrote a really English book, like a, like you know, it's, it's Victorian, like you, you can't get much more English in terms of the kind of Victorian pastiche. Um, you know, references to Margaret Thatcher, um, type levels of, of, of Englishness. And, and, and that's, it's, that's kind of when the imposter syndrome kind of really hit of like, maybe you don't have a right to write about this. Um, and, and, uh, and weirdly that's kind of, um, that's kind of my one, my big moments of seeing myself. And that was like the year The Last Jedi came out and, and everyone was, and, and, and I had this as big moment of um, seeing Ray on screen, and I, I, I kind of see her as this kind of this in, this metaphor for imposter syndrome, um, which I probably shouldn't go into because it, it's not a very, I would say it's not a very textual interpretation, but it it was it gave it fed me all the correct imagery at the correct time to make me just burst out into tears. Not that I wasn't constantly crying that film because of Carrie Fisher as well, but. Mm. Not the point. What is the point? Um, but yeah, representation I think is is complicated. Um, but I I feel like that complexity shouldn't be used to argue against the idea that, like on a basic level, can we have some racial diversity? Can there be people of different backgrounds? Like it. I feel like sometimes when you point out this complexity, it's it's used to shut down that conversation as sort of why can't you identify with white people kind of way. And it's like I can. I absolutely can. But that's the point. It's about um, the multiplicity of stories and that this bit yeah. can identify with this bit and this bit yeah, identifies exactly. with that's another bit. Yeah, and then, then that, that's that's kind of you got that's when you get the complexity and, and, and it and the stories are richer for it, I'd say. Um I I, I will also say that, like, that there's a difference between, like, sort of like a, a very big kind of, we, we now live in this world full of giant intellectual properties and all these, like, big event movies and, and these kind of big fictional worlds. And, and I think there's a very, there's a great difference between, like, a single novel world created by single authors and then these kind of giant things which are almost this modern mythology. 
um, like like a book can be very specific in what it's trying to do. Um, they can be very personal in a way that, like, you know, Pendulum Sun isn't an extended universe. Like, there, there isn't going to be 20 more Pendulum Sun novels. The entire world is created to mind fuck these two characters you know it's 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 very specific um and and in a way that you know something like harry potter or the marvel universe it's not it's it's this giant sprawling world like star wars even star trek it, it it's they're creating these spaces for readers, for viewers to imagine themselves into. And I think the responsibility for representation and that is very, very different from like single novels or single comics or single artistic works. Um, and I think we're, we're still finding it hard to talk about in some ways because whilst something like, you know, quote unquote, the Arthurian extended universe has existed forever. <laughs> um, Since about the fifth century, <clears throat> yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but but the idea that it's only it, it it can be owned by a single person or a single corporation um, that not not everyone can create stories in it. Um, that's very new or newish, um, and and I think that's that's something that we as a culture are grappling with. Um, because because there are people who do hold the keys to to Harry Potter to to Star Trek and Star Wars and so forth and um, and and there are these these myths and and this is the first time that kind of myths are owned in that way and that wanting to be part of it is only natural that they should people should be part of it mm. because they are, they've created these weird giant mirrors and and and, and I'd like to think that we don't have to seek our stories from these big places but but i think i'd be lying to say you know i don't <laughs> i mean I, I i watched star wars a stupid number of times <laughs> um i'm kind of getting a bit of that idea so i'm kind of <laughs> i'm kind of hearing from you that you might actually be one of these authors that's pro fan fiction because that helps people oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. insert their own representation into a story yes no absolutely i i, I love i love fan fiction i i, I wrote fan fiction back in the day i'm it's probably still out there on the dregs of the internet um it, it's all terrible um of course it's all terrible um but then you think under uh, the pendulum sun is terrible <laughs> it is terrible <laughs> <laughs> um, but um fan, fan fiction is great like you know it it, it it's it it, it's a lot of it's where a lot of um, writers today, like um, old new writers today, where I kind of first first wrote. It, it's it's very vigorous. People give feedback really really quickly, and and yeah, but but overall, it's brilliant. Um, and and obviously there was this whole there's some relatively infamous lawsuits as well. But hmm. um, uh, but on the other hand, you know you've got stuff like um, the wind done gone, which uh, rewrote. Um, uh, Gone with the Wind from the perspective of the slave characters, which is really good. Um, it, it was also kind of the big landmark lawsuit for fan fiction. Um, um, and, and you know, they got away with it by having this giant sticker on all the copies saying, this is a parody. Um, you know, it's, it's a parody, except it's you know, not a funny ha-ha parody. <laughs> it's, a, it's the sort of parody that kind of wrenches your heart out and and like forces you to confront how awful Gone with the Wind is. Um, but it's, you know, it's an excellent book. Um, White Sargasso Sea is brilliant, which is, which is obviously kind of, um, which is um, Bertha Mason's story from, um, from Jane Eyre and, 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 and these kind of this, we have this relationship with stories. Um, and I feel like, we're always, I mean, that's that's kind of the the very navel gazing thing for a writer to say that we're you know we're always telling stories about stories. We're always answering stories that you heard before, um, and 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 there's a sort of certain familiarity to it. There's something a comfort to reading something you kind of already know where it's going, but it's slightly different. Um, I, I love retellings. Um, I'm not a very adventurous reader in that regard. Um, 
and I like the comfort of those structures and those those echoes and these and, and you create meaning by layering stories on top of each other and the kind of you're kind of looping it back to representation one of the great frustrations when you're trying to write something which hasn't been written before is you don't have those structures of support um things already have meaning um and it's not always the things that you you want it to mean that sounds really weird i'll unpack that statement um it was incredibly uncomfortable for me as a writer when I one day I realized that if I were to describe um, certain incidents from my childhood, I didn't know how to make it sound cozy. Um, if I were trying to describe like going to um, going to the temple on um, uh, via boat and, and all those things with the incense, I all those words I only knew how to make it sound exotic. I couldn't make it sound cozy like an Enid Blyton novel. I I grappled with this a long time. I had a couple of failed short stories out of this where basically I wanted to write my childhood, things that happened to me in, you know, the so-called concrete jungle. And I wanted to make it sound whimsical and, and cozy, but it, I couldn't. Like, the word concrete itself have all these connotations. The idea of picnicking on concrete has these ideas and this baggage and you just can't take it away from that. And it was really, really uncomfortable where words just sort of, I couldn't control the words. And it was, it was this kind of weird existential crisis and had all these feelings. Um, and, but I, and, and the problem with something like like representation or the lack of representation over the years is that we don't have that language to talk about our own experiences within our culture mm -hmm. and and that's and, and we are we are poorer for it that there are all these people who think about childhood what what is a good childhood memory and we have this kind of standardized idea of what a childhood is and like of all my friends one of them has a inner you know, blighting childhood um because they they grew up i know it's really weird they were drinking ginger beer and going to islands and naming them and it was all i, I was like wow i was like you you grew up in a cottage with rose trellises and oh and it's a um, but everyone else does, doesn't. A sort of weird you turn into fairy tales. Um, the example I always love using is um, is The Little Mermaid, because everyone knows The Little Mermaid. There's been a Disney movie, and everyone, you know, if you know a little bit more, you know about the Hans Christian Andersen version, and you know how it comes a completely different ending. Mm -hmm. The thing is, though, with The Little Mermaid, is that it means so many different things to different people like most people would kind of know the kind of the, the sort of feminist reading where it's a girl who loses her voice and you know um she's giving up her voice to be with a man and that's that's and you know that that's just terrible um and and that is a completely valid reading and i need to stress that because now i'm going to tell talk about a whole bunch of other readings because there is the reading where um uh i know a lot of kind of um, kind of other kin exp or trans experiences about wanting to be in a different body or a different body kind of relating to to her experiences as a mermaid who wanted to be um, a human person um, and, and that and, and trying to uh, like that 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 being a, a way to read it um, it can be read as kind of um, uh, a, a sort of diasporic experience, uh, a, a one of wanting to, to as an immigrant experience, because she's trying to move, you know, from from one place to to another place, and you know, she she needs um, where where things are completely different, where you know, it, it, even from the, like the Disney song, you know, she that has that line about how you know up there people people will be okay with women having opinions um, and talking back to their dads, you know, um, um, and. And and these other readings, and obviously there is is the one that is from Hans Christian Andersen himself, which which is the sort of the queer reading, um, which um, this idea where um, it, it's a story about queer passing and crushing on your best friend, um, who who doesn't know you are crushing on them, um, and how you can't say it because you're passing as straight and and that and and you're passing as straight with the society and you can't talk about it. Um, 
um, and that's 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 very much from kind of Hans Christian Andersen's own life and and so forth. Um, and and all these readings are valid to me, um, and they don't cancel each other out. But on the other hand, it, it becomes very frustrating when people are talking about one meaning or one reading over the other because the meaning of the story is so fluid. It can mean so many things to different people, depending on where they were and where they are when they heard the story and whether or not, and how it shapes them. Because I think people are definitely shaped by the stories um, that they consume when they're children, mm -hmm. but the same story can shape you in such different ways. Like a story can give one person strength because of where they are in their life at the time. And it can also deprive another girl of her voice. And 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 that that frustrates me a lot about stories, how how fluid and slippery they are, how, you know, how you know, sort of the, the princess myth, the fairy tales, like like a lot of people responded very negatively to it as children and they have memories of that. And mm. Equally, there are children who who have been inspired by it, who have related to certain experiences intensely and drawn strength from it. And and you're 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 kind of balancing these these stories against each other and and how and and you end up kind of coming out and like I I end up coming out and saying well turns out that story wasn't quite how I remembered it so I'm going to tell you my version now <laughs> is sort of how I square how I square that circle where I try to tell the versions that I thought they were that, that did inspire me, I suppose. No, um, I, think, I think retellings can be wonderful. And I think you're, you're talking about all these different versions of The Little Mermaid. And to me, I, I just think truth is a many faceted diamond. You know, and it's it's uh, and at the risk of mixing my metaphors, it's a bit like the the blind man and the elephant. You know, do you, you have the one elephant, but you know, one person feels a trunk, another person feels a leg, another feels a tail. They're all feeling something slightly different, but it's still the elephant. And yep. you know, with your recitation of the different um, tellings of or different interpretations of The Little Mermaid. I read it when I was in primary school and my interpretation was closer to the queer version because I knew I was disabled. And to me, it was about passing for normal and being rejected and being that being, <laughs> being completely rejected and then becoming the foam on the ocean. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's not a, it's not a happy, it's not a happy story. No. I, 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 re I, I, re I remember being, I have this really clear memory of being like seven, like curled up on, on the chair and just crying my eyes out because of it. Hmm. Um, yeah. Hans Christian Anderson was also not a very happy man. No, but. no, I had a whole, a whole book. <clears throat> Interestingly enough, it was kind of, it was in a set, we have been in Blighton books and none of the stories I think were, you know, it was that kind of cover you know the yeah. Enid Blyton cover but it um and I think it was put out by the same publisher but I think all the stories were pretty sad I remember something about you know the girl's best friend was a, ho a talking horse so a father chopped the head off and nailed it to a gate and you know I mean some really dreadful stories are they really meant for kids <laughs> How you, it's, it's how you get past the parents. You pretend they're fairy tales. Well, they are fairy tales, indeed. Um, um, I, I think I, I'd like. I, I want to think because I somewhere deep in me there's a pretentious optimist. I, I want to think that um, that that if you give children kind of these these boxes of fluid metaphors, they'll make new meaning themselves, mm. um, and, and and that meaning will be good for them um and that's why you, you these kind of really gory simplistic horrid stories persist because they they have they have that very fluid very simple um ideas wh which are very transferable like you could see yourself in them because they're so bare bones 
mm. um, that you fill in the gaps and, and they become units of story that you take forwards into other stories. Um, mm. um, but, but even then, you know, certain stories dominate that space more than others. Um, and, and that itself is a whole different discussion. But Well, at the risk of taking a turn into the dark valley, um, you recently saw Fantastic Beasts, The Crimes of oh, Grindelwald. Dear. Oh, yes, I did, I did. And that <clears throat> has some interesting representations oh. and I was a bit disappointed because I had to oh. get off Twitter and I couldn't, like, I'm, I'm, tomorrow I'm going to be going and looking back at all your tweets, by the way. I want you to know this. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I, you, I saw enough that I'm intrigued. I want to see the rest. But, um, yes, so you, were, you went on a bit of a rant. So would you like to share that with us? So the thing about The Crimes of Grindelwald um, and, and the fantastic, but, but like, beast movies in general, like the, the two of them in general, um, they're built on a very broken premise, and I think that's that's kind of if you want to critique the movies as a whole, if I want to sound like a sensible human being and not just cherry picking random details, um, <laughs> to obsess about because that's how I, what I actually want to do it, is that the, the 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 bones of the movie is that it's telling a story about you know the the rise and the fall of Grindelwald and how he's defeated and you know he is like. A, a thousand readers kind of saw his 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 kind of passing reference and kind of basically assumed he was wizarding Hitler, and we still don't have any evidence otherwise, um, because you know he he is a sort so of like a wizard, pure blood supremacist, and he hates Muggles and he wants to kill slash enslave slash kind of make into beasts of burden Muggles. And can I just add, think he's also an albino type, which is usually shorthand for an evil Nazi, which is the reason why. I hated the last season. Well, apart from the fact that it was also oh. Johnny Depp, but yes, it's a, the, that yeah, last yeah, well, episode, yeah. Uh, uh, last scene, just to yeah. me, it was like a punch in the gut. And 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 like, and 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 the sort of the, the baseline of, you know, he's he's kind of like aristocratic and kind of queer coded as well, which is like that's how he's played throughout. Um, which is well. Um, uh, the, the trope of the aristocratic Nazi itself is both not based in reality and also incredibly problematic. But again, aside, point. And um, the trope so, of the gay Nazi doesn't work because they sent them to the yes, gas I chambers. Know. Yes. Well, yes. <laughs> Indeed. Um, point. The, the bones of it, of, of that kind of wizard versus muggle, and the muggles are being oppressed, that that doesn't work because the muggles don't get a say in the story. Hmm. They, they just don't. Like, um, you've got Jacob in the first film, but he's very bumbling sidekick. The, the muggles as a mass are not represented in the story. So you're basically telling an oppression narrative where only the oppressing class of people are part of the story. Um, and in contrast, um, and. And, you know, we, we could sit here forever and kind of talk about the problems of the original Harry Potter books. But the central kind of wizarding world conflict is the kind of purebloods versus the muggle-born. Mm. Not muggles? That, the muggles don't feature as a problem. but Because the they're prejudice... invisible in the world. I know they are. They just don't exist. Um, mm. But that, that, that conflict of pureblood versus muggle-born vaguely works in the parameters of their story because the muggle-borns are characters. Mm. You know, Hermione is one and you you know, you know, you know, she ends up, you know, that, you know, Draco says mean things about her and she punches him. And like that that's all in the story. Mm. Muggle-borns are characters. Mm -hmm. and, and and you see that conflict play out. Um and they get to have a say in why, you know, they shouldn't be oppressed. And they're they're, they're people too and yeah. they, they they're part of the story. And that's the thing with the bones of the narrative of Fantastic Beasts is that the muggles just aren't in the story. They, they, they are not in it. It's, it's all wizards discussing with other wizards. And they, may be, they, they, they might be pure, but they might not. I don't know. Um, you, you can't tell by their face. But, you know, they, they're, they're, just, they're talking to each other about, you know, where, whether or not 
they should be pro or anti Grindelwald or, or whatever. Um, and and that's that's just broken, like from the bones of that. That you you can't go anywhere good with that because you're 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 making like you're making an oppression narrative where where only the oppressors get to talk. It's <laughs> it's like having a story about the roots without the African American slaves, or a story about disabled people without people with disabilities. And you've yeah, only got well, non-disabled people talking. Yeah, and, and it's not even like it's a frame narrative. Like, I don't know, the help, which is, again, like, not good, but... <laughs> indeed. But 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 it's, it's not even like a frame narrative where, like, a white person shows up and goes, oh, yes, I am going to introduce you to this world. It's just they don't feature. They're just not there. Um, and, and, and so that, that just... Yeah, so you, you can't escape that. That aside, I'm now going to bring up some like little details I want to obsess about because um, uh, because that's what it's really about. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a nitpicker at heart, and I, I don't I'm not proud. Um, um, so so Nagini's in it, and and you know we've all everyone's kind of had a say about Nagini, and and I was weirdly optimistic going in. I was willing to say, you know, maybe it's just revealed wrong. You know, if, if we're going to get like a fully well-rounded character and like the tragic twist in her fate is that she has this basically a hereditary degener degenerative disease, um, which is awful, obviously, and very tragic. And somehow she kind of becomes a snake and falls in with Voldemort. But you, you can like, I can imagine a fanfic writer making that work. Yeah. Okay. Optimism. <laughs> but, but it's 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 just I, I i i wouldn't go back and tell myself that was really silly that was a really silly thing to say um it, it was awful <laughs> like um nagini barely gets any lines um uh and, and i think the, the worst thing about it is she's introduced by um a sort of ringmaster character in a sort of in the kind of classic freak show trope and he he tells the audience her backstory that you know that she has this hereditary degenerative disease and you and and he's like ah oh, see how she's this, you know basically this hot lady now and how pretty she is but soon she'll become a snake and then she does like a she does like the snake cg effect from the trailer um and then and, and then she escapes which is nice um but throughout it but that scene defines her because that is basically her first scene. Mm. Um, and she doesn't get to, you don't hear her talk about her disease. You don't, you don't, you don't hear her talk about how she feels about that because you never come back to that. Somebody you, you else talks have, for her. Yeah, they, they talked, this guy who, who is, you know, exoticizing, exploiting and imprisoning her, talks for her, tells you the audience who she is. And she never gets to revise that opinion for the audience. Um, and I think that's that's kind of the, the big problem with her character. She she has, and I think it's very symbolic of, of the dress that she wears. It's a really nice dress. I mean, um, it's, a, it's a lovely dress, um, but, um, and it, but you know it has this punching neckline, it has a six in effect. It's very exoticizing, and it 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 is canonically within the story. It's what she wears at the circus as part of her performance. It's it's it, it's othering. It it it's like no one else in the film wears anything like it. Mm. Um, it, it's just a completely different style, and maybe that's why you know um the the costume department wanted to keep it on screen because it's it looks different therein lies the problem narratively and, and like you know from a kind of narratively speaking it doesn't make any sense for a character not to take it off and put on literally any other clothes because it's trackies it's in a t-shirt <laughs> exactly like it, it's it, it, it's weirdly revealing it's it can't be comfortable like so from like the pragmatic angle it makes no sense and from a symbolic angle it's even worse like it's not like oh no this character is running around in nonsensible shoes it's it's her slave outfit it's it's her exotic appeal outfit you can say what it, you said on twitter <laughs> <laughs> it's the equivalent of it's equivalent of of 
Yeah, it's the equivalent of um, Slave Leia slaying, like, you know, Leia staying in the slave outfit for the rest of the movie. She she needs to take off those clothes to put on other clothes because she needs to reassert her identity outside of that weird freak show moment. Uh, and and she could do that symbolically without saying anything just by her clothes. Mm. But she doesn't. Like, she doesn't get that moment. Um she doesn't get to define herself to the audience and like her kind of coiling snaky hairdo lovely hairdo like i braid hair i'm like oh yes i i'd like to see how i could do that on my hair that's really cool but 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 again it she has that hairdo because she's a snake she doesn't redo her hair like you it, it feels like even if she doesn't get lines i feel like visually she should get to redefine herself on that kind of metaphorical symbolic narrative level and it and she doesn't and and you know she's she mopes around um she's there to worry about credence and tell him you know to to basically but but she even doesn't even get to be a sounding board like because you kind of assume that she's there to be his sounding board where he talks about his problems and she goes yes there there dear but there's only like half a scene of that and it she just i don't i just don't know what she's there to do as a character like maybe she's introduced now because jkr needs her three movies down the line she needs to do something significant like in movie four and she needs to be introduced now but it's it's just uncomfortable and weird and judged on its own merits it's it's just kind of sleazy i've seen some people commenting and they're saying things like oh you know that tree that's in that book of harry potter well now we <laughs> find out that tree is the magician or something and people oh, are secretly a, a cursed person <laughs> so it, it's full of that kind of backstory detail it's a um, bit too much yeah yeah like it i mean it's um I'm not I'm not even that annoyed about the sort of the fact that it doesn't gel with certain timelines because people uh, there are many different flavors of nerd in the universe and some of them really like timelines and I hate timelines because time is this wibbly wobbly thing of days. <laughs> yes exactly I have no idea how time works don't ask me what even our schedule so so I'm very sympathetic to anyone who's like, who kind of accidentally writes a weird timeline snarl in the backstory. I am very sympathetic to that. Um, I, I run LARP events um, and, and when we timeline people's characters, like one time we, we created a, a timey-wimey ball in people's backstories and we just went, maybe if we don't talk about it, no one will notice. And thankfully no one noticed, it was great. It was, it was amazing but um so yeah I, I have a deep deep sympathy for that um and i think a lot of people coming at this from oh yes the timelines don't match up and it's very easy to kind of dismiss that kind of criticism because but i think the thing one has to understand about harry potter is is pottermore that kind of there is this vast reams of harry potter the wiki that kind of jk rowling has been drip feeding to people for for the last blah years i don't know how long it's been running for <laughs> well it's got to be <laughs> and, yeah a while <laughs> a while and, and i think and i think that expecting that to be consistent becomes a thing that that because it's been such a a fixture of ah oh, yes tell us more um about this random character like tell us all about susan bones um and and i think there's a lot, i mean i can i can sit here and kind of armchair speculate why people do that because you know it's just i mean on some level i feel like it's just easy interview questions when you're like giving interview number of 20,000 you're like oh what am i going to talk about yeah um but but i think sometimes it comes from oh kitty <laughs> it comes from a desire to to see yourself in the story sometimes mm -hmm. i think sometimes people want to know more about the one back kid in the background kind of thing. People mm. want to know more about Cho Chang because, oh yes, here is an Asian name. Um, and not that, not that I related to Cho Chang when I was young. Like, 
I mean, you know, I was very much like, you know, a Hermione kid. You know, Cho Chang played sports. <laughs> <laughs> she was on the Quidditch team. That's <laughs> incomprehensible to me. But um, but I, I think I think that sometimes those questions come from a desire of wanting to know what they're like because they want to know what they would be like in that story, what they would be like in the world, because there are certain worlds which are written to be inviting. Mm. And I think Harry Potter has that, has all those elements. You know, people love sorting themselves into houses and, and all like it, it that furniture is very appealing. Um, it, it sort of hits that, that part of your, like it, it's the, it's the equivalent of like what superpower would you have if you're a superhero? Like you, you just like now they kind of use the wizarding world branding because, you know, someone kind of dawned that it's not people weren't, I mean, people were interested in Harry Potter's story, but people were more interested in wanting to be part of this kind of magical secret world, which tells you you're special, which we all like. You know, I like being special, too. So I don't I don't say this with any derision. Um, um, but like, you know, I want everyone to be able to feel they're special. So. And you, you've mentioned before about um, Star Wars, Star Trek and Harry Potter have this uh, large world with epic mythology yeah. and so it invites representation and if people aren't would you say that if people don't see something of themselves there that they feel invisible yeah they, they, they're not part of it and, and that's always very like that they're excluded mm. um, in a sort of this isn't for me kind of way um that that i shouldn't be here um and i think that's that's a lot of, I mean, we're, we're social creatures. We mm. humans do that thing where they, they want to feel invited. They want to feel like they belong. And, and I think a lot of, a lot of geek media, a lot of pop culture, you know, it, 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 it has all these invisible cues of telling people whether or not they belong or not, whether or not they are or are not belong in matrix society, if they're marginalized, if, if they, they are people. Mm. And, and, and I think that's, and sometimes it's very hard to articulate what it is about a piece of media that does and doesn't do that mm -hmm. because um, sometimes uh, a work can have, you know, the skin color or the faces or the women in it, but it still doesn't feel right. And, and we end up trying to kind of, it ends up being awkward trying to explain how or why that is. Like um, I ended up in this, this discussion with, where people are, when people are discussing kind of the Amazon armor in in um, in Wonder Woman versus Amazon armor in Justice League, you got you, people end up in this weird conversation where they're kind of trying to dissect the amount of skin it was covering, uh, because people felt very strongly that the the kind of armor in Justice League was not armor, it was sexualized in a way that it wasn't in Wonder Woman. Um, and the best way I found to explain it isn't about like percentage of skin covered, skin oh, kitty, um, percentage of skin covered, but um, the difference between a sports bra and a bikini. <laughs> That's a really apt description. And and the thing is, like, or even you know, sports bra and lingerie, like the amount of skin covered is actually quite similar. They they look similar superficially. They have similar-ish shapes, but they're different. They are absolutely different. One is functional and one isn't. <laughs> and, and, and sometimes when you're representing these things, especially in cinema, like the, the armor functional thing isn't functional, but it feels functional and it's good enough. And, and that's when you kind of get into the kind of hazy territory of art. Um, ooh, poor record connection, apparently. Um, and what I'm trying to say is representation can be like that sometimes where something feels off and it's very hard to articulate, but mm -hmm. you, you know, like deep down, you know, it's bad. Mm -hmm. And, and I think we'd like to hit the point where that stopped, that happened less. Um, and it'll never be, be perfect because people's experiences differ a lot mm -hmm. and you know you can find you can easily find books where one person's like oh my god this is so unrealistic and the next person goes oh this this is my this is my soul on a piece of paper so yeah but that's that's okay like that's that's why you want more stuff because because at some point 
we will have enough voices that people won't feel so rejected when they don't. And I, I think sometimes the rejection, I'm kind of spewing into a different tangent now, but sometimes the rejection people feel um, dull, can make them very critical and can make people more critical about works that they have high hopes for than mm. than than the popular works. Like people can end up like I, 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 and I say this from experience. Like I remember being like um, being a teenager and being reading Joy Luck Club, and a lot of there was a lot of Asian American um, kind of fiction mm. written by Asian Americans. And the thing is, as a girl growing up in Hong Kong, Asian Americans we had a lot in common, but it wasn't me. And I started holding it up to a standard where I wanted it to be me. And that wasn't helpful to me as a mm. human being. It made me say very mean things about the work. And it wasn't the work was inaccurate. It just wasn't me. And I wanted it to be me because culture were going, this is you, right? And it's like, no, it's it's not. Um, mm. it, it, it just isn't. Um, and I think that kind of internal criticism um, can get very bad. Like we, we hold each other to painfully high standards at times within the community because um, because we don't want to be hurt that way. Um, yeah. I, I mean, on the topic of Harry Potter, I have read a huge range of academic <laughs> articles. Now, some of them are looking at Harry Potter and... Oh, there's one about Harry Potter and the equivalencies with Canadian law for disability education or diverse education, oh, wow. something like that. There are, okay. yeah, there, there's stuff about race, there's stuff uh, about the prejudice that is in Harry Potter. And, um, and I know that I always felt really sad for Hagrid and... Um, the squibs and the muggle-borns and the, yeah. Yeah. But um, there's another research, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the authors for any of these, but there's another research paper that shows that um, children that grew up with Harry Potter tend to be more tolerant and more inclusive. So even if there's something like Harry Potter that is, no matter how justly criticised, there is some good coming out of it. I'd like to think so. Um, I, I had a, a recent um, kind of epiphany about kind of, I spent a lot of my kind of teenage years being very apolitical, like pointedly so. Um, and I, and I'm angry at my younger self. Like this is, this is where it's coming from. Like I'm frustrated with how I was. Um, and thinking back, one of the big factors was was kind of Hermione and and her whole house elf plot, um, like where she kind of starts this organization to help house elves and it goes badly. And and I know I know there are plenty of readings which kind of see her as basically the quintessential white feminist where she's kind of imposing her views on house elves. But I think for me, my takeaway from the plot was Jeanette, shut up, don't be political. Um and and I that that and, and maybe that was not the right conclusion, but that was the one I took away from it. And I I, I and that frustrates me to this day. I can I'm, see why you would take that away from it. I mean, it was it's a problematic plot. Yeah, it is. There's a, I mean, <laughs> um, there are readings of it which are are good and are interesting and and there are ways you can take it which are better but but you you keep coming back to the fact that you know house elves wizarding society it's all incredibly uncomfortable and and the books sort of dodge the question like the whole happy slave thing and and it's um and i know um and I, and I know it's it's one of those things where I think a lot of British audiences miss a lot of the nuances of that because um, the tropes it draws from are much more prominent in in, in American um, in American fiction. Because um, I was um, was uh, where I, was, I ended up in a conversation with someone from Twitter who was like, it, it they found it really awful because it really reminded them of a lot of um, 
anti-abolitionist literature, which kind of portrayed um, slaves who desired freedom as basically crazy. Um, well, actually, and, and that they, they were actually they could actually be diagnosed as being mentally ill. They were, yeah, and, and, and yeah, and and the way Dobby is framed within the context of house elves is very reminiscent of that. But the thing I keep dwelling on is is just that one thing of like, shut up, Jeanette, don't be political. Like, it, it you, your friends will make fun of you. Um, they'll tolerate you, but they'll make fun of you behind your back, and they'll think you're silly, and 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 it doesn't really matter because you can't change the world. And I really, I really regret taking that away from from the story. I, I regret, um, um, I I, re I regret that a lot, and I regret that a lot, and I, and I'm. And I suppose it's easier for me to take it out on Harry Potter and go, oh, this is why. That's the reason. Solved it now. I can hate Harry Potter and not hate myself. <laughs> um, um, which, you know, I'm, I'm joking, obviously, but, um, but that's, 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 the thing, that's the thing that there was no disappointment quite like that of a, of a disillusioned fan. But, but yes, I'd, I'd like to think that, you know, um, in terms of like Harry Potter and like children and tolerance, like I, I, I think, yeah, not all children come to reading feeling like it's for them. Mm. Um, there was a, there was this lovely little, so, you know, I, I grew up loving books and, and obviously, you know, I grew up with quite a lot of privilege with, with all the books I owned growing up and so forth. So. And, and so to me, old books have history and they're beautiful things. And I, I love annotations and margins. I love I love that history, the idea that this, this used to belong to someone. And I, I love all that. And so when people kind of talk about um, children needing new books, I was always like, oh, yes, you know, children don't need new books. They just need books kind of thing. Um, and then I, I kind of read um, an article which kind of changed the way I think about that. Um, and it was about like it was you know it was an American article. It was about um, a black inner city teacher who basically bought books for her class, and and there was this website where people strangers could buy her kids new books. Um, and the thing she said was that the children responded to it with, "You meant people on the like people out there paid money for us to have these new books," and. And that was what changed them reading. That was what brought them to read. The idea that someone was not only emotionally invested in them wanting to in, wanting them read, to, but but also that they bought it for them specifically, and therefore it was a it gift. Is for them. Mm. Yeah, and, and and that that made them read, and that made them read in a way that their previous kind of textbooks and and books, which kind of rattling around the classroom for ages, didn't because. Mm because they didn't seem like it was for them. And I think, mm. and, and that, and it made sense. Um, yeah. and, and it suddenly made sense to me why, like, you know, why sometimes children um, from like, like, and, and, and obviously I don't want to generalize to every child ever, but like, you know, children from less, less advantaged backgrounds could, could end up in a situation where they, they think these books aren't for me or like no one really cares why should i why should i care no one else cares why should i read no one else expects me to read mm. uh, and and the presence of books where it is new um, makes all the difference and i think and and just like in general that's you know um households with parents who read you end up with children who read mm. um um, and it's it's very my class is very generational. I mean, I'm, I'm British. I'm obviously I'm obsessed with class. Um, <laughs> um, now let's play into some of those national stereotypes. But but I, it, it's one of those things where mm. um, reading culture is something that it's very easy to take for granted. Mm. And obviously, because I'm a writer and because I'm story obsessed, I obviously have to self justify my profession by going, oh yes, well obviously reading is super important. <laughs> um, um, but people have said that about every medium of art, that, you know, um, art is art is practicing empathy. Um, mm. And, and each, you know, each medium has its own strengths. Um, the, the beautiful thing about writing is it's so cheap. <laughs> um, it's, it's really, anyone can write. It's, it's really easy. That's why fanfic's great. Um, I used to say I'm made of words. Cut me open and you'll just find, like, letters. <laughs> well... 
Um, can you, apart from all of the different works that you've already listed during the course of our conversation, um, are there any more books that have in, any more words, collections of words that have inspired you or that you that you really, really want other people to read? Um, <clears throat> ooh, um, sorry, I'm sitting like in the middle of a book fort. So I have this kind of urge to just like grab things to show you, um, um, which is why I'm looking. Um, um, I'm, I'm reading uh, Thousand Beginnings and Endings. That's pretty cool. Um, angle it. Um, it's, 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 it's fairy tales, like relating back to what we said earlier. It's, it's various um, fairy tale retellings and, and it, it's, it's Elliot's um, um, retelling of Tam and Cam is really good in it. Um, she's, she's talked a lot. Of, we, we've talked probably too much. Um, I, I went in probably knowing too much about um, what she's trying to do in some ways, but it's it, it's it's a story that's often likened or kind of said to be a Cinderella story and um, and and how and that kind of long shadow cast by stories and and people wanting stories to be like other stories and defining stories in relation to other stories as a result um and, and how she kind of takes that story to make it not that story and still be Tam, a, a tam and cam story without being a cinderella story is one of like a really cool and and yeah no it, it's <clears throat> um um oh chili cacao was really, was really good as well but what was yeah that? anyway um um yeah, I, I'm noticing all the books in aforementioned book fort are, are retellings. Um, the Mere Wife came out recently, which I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm taking my time to get through. Um, which is a, it's, um, Beowulf. Um, it, it's it's a it's a it's a modern feminist retelling of Beowulf. Um, it's heart wrenching, um, and you know, as someone. Who has always been a massive fan of Grendel's mother? This is this this is this is what I really wanted. Um, this is what I needed. Um, oh, um, speaking of shared worlds, um, what is really cool about shared worlds, um, like in the context of Star Wars and Star Trek and so forth, is a slightly smaller world. Is um, um, Rick Riordan's work um, in Percy Jackson? Um, I you know, was not the biggest fan of the Percy Jackson movie, or or but. Um, but I thought what was really cool is that, you know, after he started writing all these, um, you know, Greek mythology in the modern era with teenagers, uh, people started asking him, when will you write about, insert this mythology here? Um, like, you know, Korean mythology um, or like, um, or like uh, Mexican stories and so forth. And he was like, oh, actually, I don't know about any of these things. Um, uh, but instead of like doing the research and um, writing it, um, you know, kind of half arsedly from Wikipedia or whatever. Um, he went, actually, I'll start an imprint and I'll invite these other writers from these cultures to reinterpret their myths as part of the shared universe wow. of gods. Um, like, so, so, you know, it's, it's, it's so, you know, Percy Jackson is, you know, the Greek gods have children in the modern day and they fight monsters and blah, blah, blah. Um, and like he's he's still going. I think he's he's written a he's written like a Norse one and a, an Egypt one, but um, but he's also invited these other authors to, to come along. Um, so Yin Harley's written one, um, and I think uh, the Serpent's Secret written by uh, I can't remember her name right now. But there's a whole bunch of them, and they're st they're they're starting to get published this year, and they're all just really delightful. It, it's it's fun to it, it's it's nice to see that in microcosm to to mm. see people. Because, because they're, they're, they're like, it's very common in urban fantasy to have like yes, and all the gods are real, and all of them have children, and um, but it's it's really nice to see that be collaborative. And that's that's very charming. Um, well, that um, that sounds wonderful. So, with all of this, do you have another novel in process, or are you writing some more short stories? I noticed you've already had many short stories published. So I'm going through what they call the troubled second album, um, 
and I, I'm, I'm t I've, I've been repeatedly reassured. It is very common. Everyone goes through this. You know, you write, you, you have forever to write your first novel. It gets published, and then you've got like a year to write your second novel, and it goes very poorly, and then you know you tear your hair out, and so on and so forth. And so I'm, I'm in the year of tearing my hair out, and this is, I'm told, completely normal. I'll get through it, but I'm still getting through it. Um, um, like you know. Six months ago, I'd say, oh, yes, I'm writing Borgias in space, or I'd be saying stuff like I'm writing. Um, I'm writing this story about Venetian glass blowers and stuff. Um, I'm writing the story about the Mongol Empire, but on fire. I don't know. Um, but but I've, I've given up giving summaries of my work because they're all. Inaccurate, terrible. I'm not working on them. They've all crashed and burned. So, um, so I, I can't. I can't say what the next project is. I can say a lot of the research I'm doing, um, but I don't know if it'll come of anything. Um, I'm. I'm reading a lot about um, uh, different eras of Chinese women's writing, which is something I hadn't done before. Um, I. I'm. I'm really feeling the sort of the the push to write something about China or about Hong Kong, um, which, um, and I feel like, and I also know I shouldn't feel that because it's not my responsibility. Um, you know, I was always very apathetic about Chinese history growing up, partly because it wasn't something we talked about at home. It wasn't something I studied at school. Um, uh, and, and when it came to knowing about it, it was always like Chinese history is something I absorbed piecemeal from like TV dramas and things. And it's my knowledge of Chinese history is weird like that because it's so piecemeal and so sanitized. Um, so and, and now kind of finally opening books about it. And despite, you know, I was, I've, I've been a, a semi academic for forever, but but I, it's just something I hadn't really touched on. So, I mean, I mean, I'm sure there's there's a lot of like spitting in the face of colonizers in the sense of like I'm reclaiming this. But Chinese history is not not nice. Um, mm. uh, Imperial China was it still is um, colonizing force. So so I have a very weird relationship with a lot of that. Um, oh, I'm really into second person. So that's a thing I'm really into Ooh. as a as a writing style. <laughs> Interesting. I know no one else likes second person, but I've written too much second person now. I really don't like second person. I don't like being told you, you, you. It's like me. No. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, I write it a lot for role play briefs. Mm. Um, um, so I have a, a perversely large amount of experience writing um, second person. Uh, and, and, and so it, it, it comes really normally to me in a way that I suspect it doesn't to a lot of people. Um, and I keep thinking, oh, maybe I could weaponize this, but I just don't know what to do with it. Hmm. Don't. Don't is your advice. <laughs> I can see it. No, no, I'm, I'm just thinking I'd be interested in seeing it weaponized. I, I'm also interested <laughs> in seeing Borgias in space and Venetian glass blowers. So I, I will, you know, Try to keep tabs on what you're doing. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you very much for talking to me. And um, you're very welcome. I, I look forward to seeing you on Twitter and chatting again. Yes, I, I hope so too. Um, thank you very much for having me on your podcast. And bye to the audience. <laughs>